Hey, hey everybody, Z Garcia here. Today I'm going to be taking a look at some older and lesser known CCGs or collectible card games. Uh, you know, I, my, one of my favorite things in board games and card games is the element of discovery, of opening up a game and then discovering the components for the first time. It's one of the things that got me into the hobby. It's one of the things that I really love in the hobby. You know, this idea, this, this sense of wonder that you encounter when you open up new components, when you first crack open a pack of cards, that sort of thing. And collectible card games have uh, thrived on knowing how to mine that feeling out of people. And um, they've certainly worked on me before, you know. I was not, uh, you know, someone that could keep up with uh, collectible card games typically. So in the, I would say, early 2000s, I got into a lot of older dead CCGs, as in, as in collectible card games that they are no longer supporting. And so the, the market sort of just dumps that game onto eBay or something like that. And then you can go and buy up a bunch of it for fairly cheaply. And so, you know, it really, again, that, that sense of discovery was huge in this kind of game. You know, opening up booster boxes, discovering the cards, discovering the game, the artwork, you know, lots of fantastic artwork. And so today I thought I'd do a little video talking about my top five old, dead, lesser known kind of CCGs. So one thing you're not going to see in the video is me talking about Magic the Gathering, which I very much enjoy, but it's alive and thriving. I'm not going to be talking about some of the better known CCGs either. You know, I wanted to highlight some more esoteric sort of smaller games. Not to say that you haven't heard of these, it's quite likely you have, but they are some that didn't really get a lot of attention for the most part when they were out, and um, I think they were worthy of that, especially at that in that time and place when they first came out. And even now, I do enjoy every now and then bringing some of these games out and giving them a world, a world for for all time's sake, you know. So uh, that's basically it. I'm going to be doing uh, my top five, and we're going to start with five, work our way up to one. These are ranked basically by how much I appreciate owning this stuff, how much I like the system, how much I like the artwork, that sort of, uh, those sorts of uh, barometers, if you would. So that's it. Let's kick it off with my number five. Number five was published by Upper Deck Entertainment and is called the Quick Strike System. Now, the Quick Strike System, the one I have right here, is for Pirates of the Caribbean, based on the, the film property. This has characters from the Pirates of the Caribbean films, though it is artwork. It is not screen caps, and that's, in fact, one of the things I very much like about this. I don't tend to enjoy games that have screen captures of whatever movie or TV show they are based on. And so I really liked that this was doing artwork for all of the known characters, Jack Sparrow, all of those characters in, in the uh, property, in the movies. The idea here is that it's a, it's a dueling game. It's for two players. And it's, uh, it's one that actually was this quick strike system was used on, on different themes. Different uh, properties were plugged into this, like Shaman King did it. And I want to say, uh, say The Last Airbender did it. Uh, what I like about this one is that each player is going to have their own deck of cards. You have you will build your deck of cards from different uh, you know characters and uh, different cards available in the set, and then you play on a board where you don't have a hand of cards. It's it, it has an almost Euro style resource management game feel to it, in which you have your main character. In this case, I have Davy Jones here would be my uh, my leader if you would my avatar. And then you have a deck of cards with different kinds of cards in here. You set them on the table. You give yourself some green, yellow, and red energy, which is just some of these cards face down. And then you go back and forth attacking each other on, uh, on the board. You are going to just, it's sort of a, a, it's a volleyball match. You throw it into their court and you see if they can respond. 
hopefully increasing the attack power, that sort of thing. But every time you flip a card, you have three chances basically to, to defend, to, to volley that ball back. And if you cannot do it in the green zone, then you go to the yellow, then the red, and then you get hurt. Then you get hit. But the energy on the side, those face down cards, is what you use to pay for these cards. They'll have a cost, they'll have an effect, they'll have a strength, they'll usually have uh, some sort of uh, defense. And then there's other kinds of cards, like characters that help you, allies, uh, other action cards, that sort of thing. It's a very interesting game because you build the deck, you shuffle it, and then that's what you use. You, you're, you are top decking in this game. And you are hoping that the right cards come at the right time, you don't have a hand of cards, you are preparing the board to defend you. And one uh, really cool thing, and the final thing I'll say about the uh, the quick strike system here, is these cards. I forget what they call them, they have a very specific name for them. It was sort of their invention, if you would, the quick strike system's invention. The idea is that this card has a little card inside of it, like so. And you have to charge up all three of your zones before you can fire this off. It's a particularly powerful attack. It is, uh, it can be different, so the Davy Jones card that's in here, in Davy Jones, is not always the same. You know, you could see one that looks the same on the outside, and the little card inside of it is different. Same thing for my other deck, which I have here, which is for uh, Jack Sparrow himself, with a little card in there, double-sided. And so that was a very clever thing. It's, it's, it's a gimmick, certainly. You could always just have a card out there face down, uh, or two cards, so this is double-sided. And that would have accomplished the exact same thing. But it gives you a cool sort of bit to be like, ooh, what's in here? You know, I'm going to fire off the big one. And so just doing that action is like, boom, uh, massive attack coming at you, right? So it's a cool system. I like that it's different from most CCGs where you are managing a hand of cards, where you are drawing and going through the phases, all that. This one is just a, a back and forth uh, pushing each other to see who can, who can get pushed out of the, the sumo ring, if you would. And, and win the whole thing. It's interesting. Uh, it's one of the simplest CCGs I've played, which is another reason why I like it. I think this one's pretty cool. So it comes in at number five for me. That is the Quick Strike system with the theme, in my case, the one I like, the Pirates of the Caribbean theme. Number four game is Hecatomb. Hecatomb here, as you can see right away, you can tell, whoa, what's going on over here? This is a, uh, a five-sided card, which is also a plastic card, with parts of it that are translucent. Hecatomb was published by Wizards of the Coast, and it is sort of a, a, a sidestep, I think, from Magic the Gathering. It is largely feels like Magic the Gathering. It is based on Magic the Gathering. It has a much more adult theme. It's darker, it is um, grittier, and it has a few interesting sort of uh, evolutions on magic. I'm not going to say it's better than magic, I don't think it is, but it does take concepts that are not in magic and grafts them onto that, um, that frame. I have here also, these are really cool, these, were, these are fairly rare, but the, the box here, to hold these weird shaped cards, and then you could keep a, a deck of cards in there, shuffle these up, which is no easy feat, I'll tell you, and then you're ready to play. The game has mana. Um, in this game, though, there are no mana cards, like in Magic the Gathering. Any card face down is mana, which is nice. And uh, the main twist here, you are, um, a, uh, you are end bringers, I believe they call them, and you are attempting to destroy the world. Great. <laughs> and you are going to be doing that by attacking your opponent, reaping souls. Again, it's a very dark theme. But the main twist here is that most of these are characters. They're evil things that you are summoning. And the way it works is you, you put these cards together to create abominations, which will then turn around and attack your opponent. So if I summon something like this, and then later summon something like this, you could rotate these, stack them on top of one another like so, and now, you have a, a level two abomination, two beings brought together by my dark magic and stitched together, right? 
And so you would then have this, it would tap just like, you know, they, they, they was Wizards of the Coast, so they could use tap and they would attack the other player. And there were rules about the strength combining each of the critters for a total strength, destroying some off the top of the abomination here, things like that. So it's, it's, it was a very clever concept where you just kept stacking these cards. And then besides the creatures, you had some that were just action cards, you know, they would just do whatever. Uh, the artwork in this one is certainly very good, also extremely dark, and the concepts are very clever. I like that the game has sort of a built-in timer, in which at the beginning of each round, each uh, turn, you automatically get one soul, one point. And so the game will end uh, because it has to, because you will be eventually have 20, which is what you're attempting to do, and you're taking some from your opponent. It, it, it's the kind of game that ultimately is a better multiplayer game than a two-player game, though I'll admit I've played mostly two-player, which is fine. But um, once someone gets a nice big abomination, they're sort of hard to take down. The game might be over before you're able to do that. And so if you're the kind of player that enjoys having a lot of stuff out there, you don't really get that in this game. You are going to work on two abominations typically, maybe three, but there's usually not a bunch of stuff going on out there. Uh, this game had the original base set release, and then there were two expansions for it. There's enough out there to play, uh, certainly, and it's, it is an enjoyable game. Though, again, I would recommend it as a multiplayer game a little bit more because it balances out someone just not getting up to speed fast enough. I like it. Certainly for adults and adult audience because of, again, just the, the theme and the artwork and all of that. But a uh, clever, interesting game. Not, not just a, a, a reprint or a re-theme of Magic the Gathering. The mechanisms here are their own and they are clever. And it uses the idea of these transparent cards in a cool way. So this is one that I've always thought, huh... I like that CCGs were attempting to do different stuff. As I said, for Quick Strike, it's, it's one that's very much about playing just on the table, no hand of cards. And this one has interesting things as well, both from the production point of view and the way it works. It was a very expensive game to produce. The, the packs of boosters, the booster cards, were certainly expensive, which I think is also did not do it any favors when they were trying to market the game. But it's one that I'm glad I have around and one that... Um, Again, if you enjoy the, the weirder side of these old, dead collectible card games and you haven't heard about Hecatomb, maybe you could look into it as well. So that's my number four, Hecatomb. Speaking of games that were very highly produced, my number three brings me to Anachronism. Anachronism is a card game, but it plays and feels like a miniatures game. It's a game in which the boosters that you bought were in fact not random. When you bought a booster, you always got the same five cards that you would, anybody else who bought that one character booster would get. And then you could mix and match different characters to decide which card you wanted to play with, which again was just five. But let me back up a little bit and explain what this is and where it came from. Anachronism was, as you can probably tell from the massive H on the back of the cards here, co-published by the History Channel. And the game is about characters from history, uh, great warriors, great leaders, being brought together to the arena in an anachronistic way, of course, uh, to do battle. And so you could have uh, a famed samurai warrior going up against Catherine the Great, going up against uh, William Wallace, whatever, right? So it was, it was all sorts of historical periods and historical figures. It's a very cool idea. Uh, the game, as I said, was, is very highly produced or was very highly produced. These cards are basically tiles. They're very thick cardboard and every single card in the game is uh, printed in foil as well. So the cards are attractive, they're shiny, they look amazing. It's a beautiful game. Now, uh, having said all that, and the, the, the boosters, by the way, were not, were not inexpensive either because the game was very highly produced and you would just get five cards. The gameplay 
was perhaps deceiving uh, if you went into it not knowing what you were going to get. If you bought the game, you, you understood the concept being gladiatorial battles of historical figures, and then you sat down to play the game and realized it was a fairly random five to ten minute uh, dice chucking kind of match which I think did not do the game any favors. Uh, that's not to say that that's bad. I actually enjoy the game clearly. It's on my list. But you have to go into it knowing that that's what you're getting. It's a very light, pretty straightforward, dice chucking and some tactical maneuvering on the board kind of game. You have your character. They have some special power. They have stats like life and movement points and uh, knowledge and strength, things like that. They also have an attack grid at the top which tells you from where they're standing and from their point of view where they can attack around them, right? And you're going to put them on a grid on the table. And then they'll maneuver around the board. So you can, you know, move them and rotate them, that sort of thing. Roll dice to attack your opponent. And then every round, the game plays over, uh, I believe it's uh, five rounds. Then you are going to reveal, you're going to place these in whatever order you want to the other four cards. Again, this is all you play with, it's five cards the character and and five supporting or four supporting cards every round you flip over a new card and something new comes into play it could be a weapon it could be an inspiration it could be uh some event some special power for the rest of the match that sort of thing so the game actually allowed you quite a bit of choice in that in that side of the equation right? you you got to pick which cards you played with you could mix and match time periods warriors whatever you get to decide the order those cards came into play, uh, which could sometimes be very important. You got to decide uh, where you started on the board, those, those sorts of things. But then the dice rolling really was very swingy. It's a game that you, you cannot go into thinking, I should win because my character is better. No, you could just get completely hosed by the dice rolls and just lose. But as I said, it's a five to ten minute game. It's very short. And I just love the look of the game. I love the theme of the game. I love the way that they sold it, which probably did not do them any favors because it was not random, really. Um, I love the component quality for the whole thing. The gameplay has all the powers on the cards and that sort of thing are not overly complex. So I like that. It's an easy game to play. It's it's. And it's fun just to just to duke it out for a few minutes, and then you could even reset and do it again. You could swap characters and do it again. So I really like this one. It's one that was in many ways sort of destined to fail. It's uh, a hard game to market, for one thing. It's a game that was clearly overproduced when it probably did not need to be, uh, making the cards and keeping up with the game very expensive. And then it's a game that, you, uh, the game you end up getting, the game play you end up getting, does not seem to match the product you bought. I've bought plenty of them uh, on the secondary market. They're very cheap now, you know. The game's obviously uh, uh, gone the way of the Dodo. But I really enjoy it. So it's, it's one that if you are looking for just a silly, light filler, and you, and you enjoy the historical bend to the whole thing, even if you want just want to do a little research about some specific character in history you know then uh, i would maybe uh say check it out i enjoy it it's probably one that out of all of these is probably the most divisive one out of all the ones i'm going to show you today here but i dig it i think it is very well done it's a cool concept and i just find myself uh ooing and eyeing over the uh over the cards here and how well everything is done you know it's just a beautiful game so that is my number three Anachronism. My number two is called Dark Age Feudal Lords. And Dark Age is a theme that is still around. It's, a, it's an RPG setting. It is, uh, I think there's a miniatures game based in the world. So it's, it's a very captivating a setting that is has, has stuck around. The card game, unfortunately, did not stick around for very long. In fact, this one did not have any expansions at all. The original set came out, and that was it. It was one release. There is no, there was nothing else for it. But a couple of things have kept this one high on my 
ooh, what a cool CCG list. The first is the artwork. There's a very small select a group of artists that worked on these cards, and I find the artwork in these to be really captivating. One of the main uh, artists on the game, and in fact one of the co-designers, is Brom, a very uh, well-known artist, and I just completely and absolutely adore his artwork. I think it is captivating. I think it's uh, it's filled with emotion. It is filled with uh, sort of potential energy, you know, and uh, it's a very stark look to everything. I'm a big fan of the post-apocalyptic setting. And so his artwork and the other artists in the set just really come together to give you this uniform look to the whole thing, which very much, much works for me. The idea is you are... Uh, warring gang lords, if you would, in a post-apocalyptic setting, and you are going out there and raiding and taking over locations, trying to score some points. You're going to be putting together a war gang and, and attacking. That's, that's the gist of it. Um, the other thing that's really cool is that the game has a combat system that feels very much like a tactical miniatures game, and it's, it's very smart, really dig it. There's a lot of luck in this game. You are drawing cards, which is random, and then you are attacking using dice, which is random. And in fact, resource production in this game is based on dice rolls, which is random. And that one can actually be pretty bad and pretty swingy. Because I could roll for, you know, I forget what they call them exactly, but recruitment points. I could roll a die and get two, and you could roll one and get six. And you can simply do more than me this turn, you know. So that's not great, but it kind of fits this messed up theme of bad stuff going down in the uh, in this apocalyptic setting, you know. But anyway, back to the combat system. The way it works is every character, which just some of the cards are characters here, they have stats on the side, they have a string of numbers across the bottom, and so some of the numbers are for distance fire. When you first attack each other, I roll my two six-sided dice, you roll yours as if I hit you at distance fire. So, for example, this character here, which is called a Disciple of the Fall, not a named character, this one, just there are many Disciples of the Fall, she hits at range uh, on, an on an 11. So if I roll my two dice and I get 11 or 12, then I hit at distance fire. And then the characters engage. And then her, her melee combat string has a 6, 10, 12. That means if I roll my two dice and I get a 7, I hit you at the 6, which is one hit. If I rolled 10, I hit you at the 6 and at the 10. And then if I rolled uh, 12, I hit you three times. It's the most she can do. And then she also has some numbers for defense. And it's a really cool system that can be modified by attachments to these characters, by weapons, by lots of different effects. And it's, it's very cool. Lots of action, lots of dice chucking in the game, wiping people out. You get victory points for taking people out. You, uh, there's a little bit of a bluffing element in the game even, where you can play a card face down and say, okay, if I do this or this other thing, I'm going to get extra victory points. But that card could not be the thing you're saying. You could be bluffing. There is uh, modifiers to the, ter to the terrain in which you're fighting, which is also a card you put into play. The whole thing has a great look, has a weird Mad Maxian vibe to it, and I really dig it. I, I this is one I would love to see get the this new and improved, uh, you know, non collectible collectible card game, living card game, you know, kind of treatment. Because I think with some sprucing up of the mechanisms, the artwork can stay. The uh, definitely the combat mechanism, I think, for the most part, should stay. I would change the resource management aspect of it because it's a little iffy. But, wow, I would love to see more in this universe. I would love to get a box of this that gives me that CCG feel without being collectible and with, you know, new and improved mechanisms. Really dig it. Absolutely one of my favorite CCGs. One that does not come out very often. One that was, um, uh, again, did not get any support. The rule book even was not that great. There's... Uh, couple of mistakes in it, but one that I really love, and I, I, I just keep it around because it is so gorgeous. If for, if for nothing else, I would just keep it around because this artwork, and, and there's a good amount of it, is fantastic. So that's my number two, Dark Age Feudal Lords.
And finally, we come to my number one, which might surprise you because I'm not someone who enjoys typically licensed games, games based on an IP. But this game is, and it is based on the Nightmare Before Christmas movie. This is the Nightmare Before Christmas uh, trading card game. And it is a game that if you had said to me, this is a great CCG, you're really going to enjoy it, give it a shot, I might have perhaps uh, not taken your advice, let's say. And I forget why this game even got uh, played by me. I, I forget how I got into it. I forget why I played it originally. But it's one that certainly came out of nowhere to surprise me with how excellent of a game it is. Never mind the uh, distribution model of it being collectible in booster packs. Never mind the film property, which I do like, but I'm not in love with. The game is just really good. And, and to its own detriment, it's almost too good because... It feels like a Euro game, and so you are, uh, once you have figured out the right deck that you want to play with, once you've built your deck, you're kind of done. You can just play that deck. It's sort of like a well-balanced Euro game at that point, and you just play that game, you know? No one sits around thinking, oh, I need a new card in this Euro game to, to fix this one thing that doesn't seem to be working well. And that, um, you know, it's almost the, the thing that... I think hurt the game a little bit that it's too good it's too balanced it, it feels like a resource management game in it what you are doing is you are of course it's a, it's a nightmare before christmas uh setting and you are taking 12 turns the 12 days of christmas to develop up your halloween town you're going to be putting locations into play one per turn and then you are going to be using scare points to play cards and the cards are going to be characters from the movie like Jack Skellington here or they are going to be creations that you put into play and just set aside for victory points or they are going to be uh, surprise cards which are sort of instant events that you would then play and just set aside um, and you're done with them and the whole thing you're going to play your, your 12 rounds and then once that's done you count up all your characters the, the number on them, you count up your inventions, the number on them, anything else that might score, and you see who has the highest score in the game. There is no, I attack you until I kill you. There is pretty much very little attacking, in fact. There's a little bit of messing with your opponent, but the game is fairly solitaire. I'm just trying to build up my thing better than you, and there's a little bit of interaction at the beginning of each round where I pick a thing, an action, that we both get to do, the one of us, might get to do it for free. And that's, that's most of the extent of the interaction unless you actively go for those cards which are available. Um, but the whole thing is tactical, it's rich, it's interesting because depending on the order in which those locations come out for you, it will be a different play experience. Sometimes you have to adapt to what you want to do. But for the most part, you figure out what you want to do and you build a deck for that and then you do it, hopefully better than the opponent. Uh, one of my decks in this case has, uh, I do a lot with the Mayor and, uh, and Locke, what, what are the names, Locke, uh, Stock and Barrel. You know, and the, the idea is I, I put the Mayor out first, and then the Mayor has a special power that it lets me move some characters around, and that's, that's it. That's what I'm hoping for. That's what I'm attempting to get the game to do. Sometimes that doesn't pan out because I don't draw the right cards, and sometimes the locations come out in a weird way. Those locations have on themselves powers that once you've placed enough characters at that location you get to trigger that power at the beginning of your turn you get some points you draw some cards that sort of thing you will cycle through this game uh, you'll cycle through the deck you know sometimes you want to do that faster you know sometimes you want to uh, there are decks designed to burn through the deck and you shuffle up and go again another thing not typically seen in collectible card games where your deck is a resource that if you run through then you start getting hurt, right? So the whole thing almost feels like cheating putting it on this list because while it technically is collectible, it even had an expansion, which was Christmas Town. Uh, kind of a weird direction they went with it, but it's fine. It almost feels like cheating because it doesn't really feel like a CCG. It feels like a card game that they released weirdly, you know? So this is another one that I would very much love to see come back, uh, perhaps even re-implemented with a new theme. You know, the mechanisms 
are fresh. The whole concept works. I dig the whole thing. The theme is great, don't get me wrong, but in many ways at this point is probably limiting, right? So if I had my way with this game, I could, uh, I could put it out again and I would re-theme it and I would keep the mechanisms in intact. And of course, it would have to be some sort of living card game or something. So one that I was certainly blown away by, played it a ton. I have played this game quite a bit. In fact, I've probably played the Nightmare Before Christmas TCG more than these other four games combined. That's quite possible. Maybe not, might be close, but I've played a bunch. Games take about 20, 30 minutes. Uh, maybe a little more, about 30. And they are just so rich. I, I love the development. The game has a nice curve to what's going on. Uh, the hand management is a big thing. You don't just, you know, always automatically draw cards. You have to make that happen. Managing your points is a big deal. The whole thing really feels like a great tight package. One of the co-designers on this is uh, Andrew Parks, who has gone on to great success with uh, deck building games, other board games, things like that, and he is really a smart guy. Uh, the other uh, co-designer, in fact, is uh, Zev Schlesinger, who is uh, the man who started Z-Man games, who now works for WizKids. So, great pedigree there, and I love it. It's a great game. It's one that I would very much recommend you look into it, especially if you enjoy that theme, or if you have someone who enjoys that theme. This is good stuff. I'm not sure how expensive it is. I'm not sure how difficult it is to find. It might be harder to find now, but very cool. Dig it. One of my favorite, not old weird dead CCGs, but just one of my favorite CCGs in general. I adore it. And for me, this one gets my number one spot. Really, really cool. The Nightmare Before Christmas trading card game. And that's it for me. I think I've rambled enough. That is a bunch of old weird CCGs that might or might not have heard about that I think are pretty cool still. And I love just getting into and I've loved opening booster boxes uh, or booster packs for all of these. I've loved the, the sense of discovery that comes with them. Seeing new rare cards, discovering new artwork, new mechanisms, new things like that. I've played a bunch of CCGs. These are some of my favorites. And uh, maybe it'll inspire you to go down to the basement, dig through some boxes, and bring out some old CCG cards of your own. And hey, maybe give them a whirl, because these games are still fun. So as long as you're having fun, we're all good. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. I'll see you real soon. Thanks so much for watching the Dice Tower videos. Find more great videos and reviews, as well as our top-rated audio podcast at Dicetower.com. You can also find other great shows at Dicetowernetwork.com. I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching The Dice Tower. The Dice Tower is sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., where you can find great games for great prices. Cool Stuff, in stock. Check them out at CoolStuffInc.com.